With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the Agnet News Hour. Coming up later, it's a new record for Fresno County Ag values, but there are still some challenges within the margins. We'll have more on that. But to start off today, a discussion of artificial intelligence. In fact, AI could enhance the way farmers work. David Geiger has this report. Farming in the 21st century has an emphasis on technology. Don Johnson with the University of Arkansas uses the microcontroller as an example. It's a small computer performing tasks based on custom programs. Sensors input data, allowing potential performance of a variety of tasks, from climate controls to drone applications. However, Johnson points out a problem. Most uh, agriculture students at the college level, most farmers don't have any deep expertise in computer coding. Johnson recently published a study finding agriculture students who were unfamiliar with computer coding were able to program a microcontroller by using AI. Generative AI systems like ChatGPT, for example, will write a dandy code if you can explain uh, the, the physical setup of your hardware and can explain exactly what you want uh, the uh, microcontroller to do, uh, it will write a wonderful code and it opens up the use of microcontrollers to folks who uh, don't have a lot of experience in that area. This is generative AI, meaning the tool will create content. And as technology progresses, farmers can use it to help solve some of the technical difficulties that come along with it. I don't believe that generative AI is ever going to replace the knowledge and experience of a good farmer. But I do believe that a good farmer armed with uh, generative AI and the ability to use it proficiently uh, will have an advantage over a good farmer who does not have that ability. Johnson sees real promise in feeding information into specialized generative AI programs that look into current crop prices, yield data, and the cost of chemicals. And then come back with a set of recommendations for a farmer to consider or a crop consultant to consider as far as controlling those insects and and not just, uh, you know, how much to spray and where to spray it, but uh, the economic uh, implications of that. Johnson tells his students, if you can do what generative AI can do, there's no reason to hire you. But if you can add value to generative AI by your education and knowledge and understanding, and you can produce a product greater than what you alone or what generative AI alone could produce, then you're valuable in the job market. And I think that applies to farmers too. I don't. Uh, I think that farmers uh, can add value to generative AI. Generative AI can add value to farmers' decision making. And I think in the end, it's a win-win situation. The farmer will get better management decisions, and uh, and AI will be a, an aid in doing that. Ultimately, Johnson thinks AI technology is transformative for agriculture. It's here. It's it's going to increase in the future, and it, it's a part of agriculture now, and it will be increasingly a part of agriculture in the future. I'm David Geiger reporting. President Biden and Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack were in Wisconsin to announce a major rural energy investment. Gary Crawford has more. The biggest investment in rural electrification since the mid-1930s. That's how President Biden and Agriculture Secretary Tom Bilsack are describing a newly announced $7 billion investment in rural clean energy projects in 23 states. To bring the promise of clean energy and lower costs to approximately 5 million rural households, as well as farms and businesses that are located in those 23 states. Tom Vilsack says designated rural electric co-ops will be using the USDA loans and grants to build new, more resilient power-generating systems. All of this is designed uh, not only to provide more reliant electricity for those rural communities, but will also result in a 43.7 million ton annual reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The equivalent of taking 10 million gas-powered cars off the road. Bill Sachs says these energy projects would also generate about 20,000 jobs. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Brazil has perhaps quietly become one of the leading cotton-producing nations in the world, but its history in reaching that point has been filled with challenges and innovations. Here's Rod Bain. If asked about Brazil and agriculture, perhaps one's first thoughts turn to commodities like corn, soybeans, and sugar. 
What they may not realize is how significant Brazil is regarding world cotton production. This South American nation trails only China, India, and the U.S. in global production. But as Lydian Eichelt of Brazilian firm Olin Agri told an audience at this year's USDA Agricultural Outlook Forum, this journey to become a significant world cotton supplier has been centuries in the making. The commercial production of cotton started in 18th century. When Brazil was a Portuguese colony. Agreements between Portugal and England led to Brazil being chosen to be one of the suppliers of cotton to Europe. Originally, cotton was grown in the northeast area of Brazil. Production area would expand in the 1930s. The coffee crisis price, so the growers in the southeast region, they had to find other options to plant. So they started to plant cotton in Sao Paulo region. At that time, the properties were very small, very well mechanized. They didn't have machines, so they just just hand pick the cotton and was a very family farming model, a very small production model. This production model remained in place through the 1980s. The first year of that decade saw record cotton area and crop yield in Brazil. Soon after, the nation's cotton crops were infested with cotton boll weevil, leading its government to shift to cotton imports. 1997 was a notable year in Brazilian cotton history, record imports, and a collapse in domestic cotton production. What changed to reverse Brazil cotton production going forward? Eichelt said it started with a new production model at the turn of the century. In addition, the expansion to the center-west region of Brazil, that's the Cerrado. There was a big, big focus on R&D. RAPA is our local R&D institution that is linked with the government. Modernized production and harvesting innovations were coupled with the formation of grower organizations. Cotton production expanded into flat areas of Brazil and as part of a crop rotation with soybeans. And most growers own their own ginning equipment. What has this meant regarding Brazil's cotton crop in the now and in the future? More about that in a future program. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. You are listening to the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. In today's National Spotlight, continuing extreme heat and dryness in the western U.S. continue to be reflected in both record-setting high temperatures and wildfires in the region. Rod Bain has more. Extreme heat has again ramped up in much of the West, strengthening going into the fall months. The prevalence of this heat wave evident in Phoenix, Arizona. As of Tuesday, a record 100 consecutive days of triple-digit heat. Also evident, according to USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey, through ongoing wildfire threats. We have seen a few showers nibble away at the dryness in the Pacific Northwest. A few areas of the Southwest, namely the Southern Rockies, have seen enough monsoon-related showers to tamp down the wildfire threat. But for the rest of the Western United States, we will have to await seasonal rain to knock down this wildfire threat that generally continues all the way from California and the Great Basin, all the way through the Northern Rockies. Significant wildfire activity has occurred the past two weeks in parts of Wyoming and Montana in cases resulting in loss of several head of cattle and livestock infrastructure like fencing. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, severe heat waves do much more than pose a threat to human health. Gary Crawford reports. Were you one of the roughly 150 million Americans who were under severe heat alerts last week? And yes, fall was approaching, but over the south and much of the nation's midsection last week, summer did not want to let go, and it brought record heat to a lot of places. One of the challenges we face is the very low awareness about heat as a health risk. A health risk. Dr. Christy Ebai at the University of Washington says many of us hear the warnings, you know, stay inside, stay hydrated, do outside work in the early morning, etc. So we hear those things, but we don't think they apply to us. But the truth is... The list of the most vulnerable during a heat wave is quite long. That list includes pregnant women, very young children, people with chronic medical conditions, outdoor workers, and the list goes on. But, she says, among the most vulnerable to heat stroke are people over 60 years old. Now, you would think that maybe older folks would handle heat better because they've had a lot of experience with heat waves in the past. But unfortunately, a natural part of the aging process is people become less well able to tell they're getting into trouble with the heat. Or less willing to admit it. So even if they know that it's hot outside, they don't necessarily make changes in their behavior 
that would help prevent heat stress. Which can go right into heat stroke. Heat stroke is a medical emergency and requires immediate medical intervention. And even with medical intervention, the mortality rate is high and people who survive heat stroke often have lifelong consequences. Officially, it's estimated that heat kills about 700 Americans every year. Dr. Ebai thinks the actual number is much higher than that, but that most deaths could be prevented with more efforts at programs. To increase awareness of the health risks of heat. But Dr. Ebai says the effects of more frequent and more severe heat waves go far beyond posing possible medical problems for individuals. We also need to think about environment. You have periods of very high temperatures. I live in the Pacific Northwest. That goes along with drought. That goes along with wildfires. That affects air quality, and so you get these compounding and cascading risks that affect people, but also affect livelihoods. Plus, of course, another effect. We're seeing power disruptions with high temperatures. And, of course, power brownouts and blackouts make it even harder for people to survive severe heat outbreaks. And Dr. Ebai says until we do something about climate change, the heat situation is very likely to keep getting worse. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's today's National Spotlight. Now we go back to Rod Bain for the Livestock Report. Maybe you've seen these voluntary labels on meat and poultry products to indicate how animals were raised. Raised without antibiotics, grass-fed, free-range, even environmental-oriented labels with claims such as raised using regenerative agricultural practices and climate-friendly. Oversight of such claims is conducted by USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service. USDA's authority comes from two basic parts of the meat and poultry laws. Number one, we're responsible for ensuring that the products we regulate are safe. Secondly, we are responsible for ensuring that labels are truthful and not misleading. Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety Sandra Eskin says in both regards, guidelines are used as recommendations for and documentation of animal raising and environmental related claims on meat and poultry product labeling. It provides some guidance to companies. It is not in and itself enforceable. Companies should rely on it. And then when our labeling review team looks at labels and labels claims, they will refer to it. The guidelines themselves are reviewed periodically for updates with 2019 being the last time for such updates, until now. In the last couple of years, we've heard from many stakeholders who are concerned that these claims aren't adequately supported. In response, the labeling guidelines were updated to strongly encourage the use of third-party verification to substantiate animal raising and environmental related claims for meat and poultry products. In this context, they're particularly valuable because USDA's authority does not reach back to the farm. We cannot determine whether a product is in fact grass-fed or free range, and therefore we have to leverage these certifiers who have standards and who have systems to ensure the standards are correct. Additionally, more robust documentation behind animal raising and environmental related claims are strongly suggested. The Deputy Undersecretary says the labeling guidelines, as guidelines, became effective when released August 28th specifically. Public comment on the updated guidelines are being accepted now through October 26th through the Federal Register. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This is the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with a preview of what you'll hear today on AgNet West, here's Brian German. 2023 was a record crop year for Fresno County, but that's not quite the whole story. Fresno County Farm Bureau CEO Ryan Jacobson said that while total value was just under $8.6 billion, many growers are still facing significant challenges. Yeah, it ended up being a decent year, at least when you look at that overall number. It was the record-breaking number for us in 2023 and actually ended up being somewhat of a surprise to me because even though we did have water, which allows us to grow additional crops, 
this uh, it is another year of growth. And again, there's a couple things that are going on that I think are important when we look at this. First and foremost, this number is gross, not net. And I say that because even though we're having this record-breaking number, I would actually say that it's probably one of the toughest times we've seen on the farm here in probably the last 40 years. Because, I mean, we've saw a massive increase in our input costs over the course of the pandemic. Some of those have adjusted downwards, but a lot of them have not. And so when you look at the margin side of things, the inputs went up much faster than what we actually saw the income side go up there. There's always exceptions to that. There are some commodities that are still doing good, but for the most part, I would say a lion's share of our commodities during the 2023 year, we're not overly healthy or we're struggling simply because of what we were looking at for as far as market prices, as well as the input costs, which have really dramatically affected the bottom line. ATVs and UTVs have a significant role in farming operations. Principal lecturer in the Agricultural Sciences Department at Clemson University, Hunter Massey highlights some safety tips to keep in mind when operating an ATV or UTV. The one that I think people misunderstand is the right machine for the operation, so the task that you choose to use that machine for, and the operator. So obviously if you're a smaller person, you need a smaller machine. That allows you to be able to handle it better, operate again on that rough terrain, proper PPE, personal protective equipment. So helmets, goggles, long sleeves, long pants, boots, and gloves are recommended. And then I think another one that's a big role that I know I see a lot of violators never ride on a public road. The fact that that ATV is designed to operate off-road, handle through that uneven terrain, and when you hit that paved surface, it's going to respond and it's going to actually handle differently. So there's many cases, even just crossing over a road at a high rate of speed, it's going to change the way that ATV operates. There's obviously age restrictions for the machine when they designed it. Those are all really important. You can look at the long list. Uh, The ATV Safety Institute puts out their golden rules, and it gives you a really good guidelines to kind of follow there. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is teaming up with American businesses to boost fertilizer production in the U.S. USDA has awarded $35 million to seven projects across seven states through the Fertilizer Production Expansion Program. This program helps businesses modernize equipment, adopt new technology, and build production plants. So far, the USDA has invested $286.6 million in 64 projects, creating 768 jobs and boosting domestic fertilizer production by over 5.6 million tons. These investments should lower costs for U.S. farmers. The overall program was created in response to skyrocketing fertilizer prices driven by factors like the war in Ukraine. It's part of a broader push to support farmers, promote fair competition, and address global food insecurity while also tackling climate change. State and federal officials are being called on to temporarily stop the Fall X2 regulation for 2024. The water blueprint for the San Joaquin Valley and the Southern California Water Coalition have sent a letter to Governor Gavin Newsom and the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, asserting that while the rule was meant to help the Delta smelt by increasing Delta outflow, it's not been effective. Instead, it's led to major water supply reductions, with the groups asserting that the Fall X2 action cost an estimated 734,000 acre-feet of water in 2023, valued at $557 million. At the same time, a group of water contractors have sent a similar plea to the Department of Water Resources and U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. The group, which includes the Friant Water Authority and Westlands Water District, estimate that the measure will reduce water supplies by another 350,000 acre-feet this year, equivalent to nearly $200 million. The 10th anniversary Cal Poly Strawberry Center Field Day last month marked a decade of collaboration between the California Strawberry Commission and California Polytechnic State University. The event's the largest of its kind for the California strawberry industry and highlighted advancements in sustainable farming practices. Over the past decade, the center's expanded from focusing solely on plant pathology to include entomology and automation, with over 1,500 strawberry genotypes evaluated for disease resistance and 147 students trained in strawberry production and research. Key achievements include over $7.7 million in external funding, more than 30 awards, and the introduction of innovative tools like the UVC light for pest management and various automation devices. The research and innovations developed at the center are essential for advancing sustainable strawberry farming practices, benefiting growers, farm workers, and the environment. I'm Brian German for AgNet West Radio Network.
Some problems with backyard poultry. That's coming up on this line of hours. More than 400 cases of salmonella across the country are linked to backyard poultry. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported more than 100 people have been hospitalized. Texas and Missouri have the most cases, followed by Minnesota, Washington, Michigan, and Oklahoma. Nearly 70 percent of those who have been sick say they've had contact with backyard poultry. Backyard poultry like chickens and ducks can carry salmonella germs, even if they look healthy and clean. You can get sick from touching your backyard poultry or anything in their environment and then touching your mouth or food, thereby swallowing the salmonella germs. Always wash your hands with soap and water immediately after touching backyard poultry, their eggs, or anything in the area. Experts also say to keep your backyard poultry and the supplies you use to care for them outside of the house. Always supervise children around poultry and make sure they wash their hands afterwards. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Chuck Zimmerman. At the Farm Progress Show, I'm visiting with Syngenta. And uh, Dave, first of all, before we go any further, uh, tell us your name and what you do for the company. So, uh, David Flackney, um, I'm head of U.S. State Affairs, which, um, so we manage legislative and regulatory issues and relationships across the channel uh, in all 50 states. So what would be uh, some of the key issues that you're dealing with on, on behalf of, of Syngenta and uh, your customers, of course? Well, as you know, we, uh, Syngenta is an innovation company. We bring products to uh, American agriculture and very passionate about that. There are those that um, are out there that try to undermine our ability to bring that innovation to the farmer. So my team manages uh, state legislation. Um, for example, the state of New York last year passed a bill that um, would have put some restrictions on seed treatments, which has been a, a topic in across the country. But uh, the the so been working on things like that in the Northeast and in the West. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's really about defending the use of these tools, which have been registered by EPA, so that the growers have the innovation they need to to uh, f- you know feed the planet. Do you have, uh, I want to say, a team that handles different regions for this? Yeah, so my uh, my team is five of us that manage different regions of the country um, and work with our friends and allies with the corn growers, the farm bureaus, the soybean association, and, and all of the different commodity groups at the state level to um, advocate for sound policy that allows our farmers to be you know, as productive as they can be. I think there's been efforts to get organizations or companies to kind of, I want to say, partner together on some of these issues. You know, more voices maybe will will help. Well, I'll give you a perfect example of that. And this dates back quite a few years, but it's still in place. In 1994, US EPA um, started what was called the Special Review on Atrazine, and right th- Right at that time in 94, 95, a organization was uh, put together by the grower community, by our customers, called the Triazine Network. And the goal of that was to ensure that there was a science-based conclusion to the atrazine re-registration. It's been operating since 1994-95, and uh, we're still working uh, with EPA today in July of uh, July 7th of this year the EPA put out an update. Um, it, it was somewhat favorable, but there's still some work that needs to be done. Um, they increased the level of concern from 3.4 parts per billion to 9.7 parts per billion in streams on a 60-day rolling average, which was a directionally correct improvement in the, in the level of concern. But there are still issues with respect to the models that they're using um, to determine where mitigation might be required. What is probably right now the highest priority to try to help make sure that farmers are being able to get the kind of products they need, use them in a safe manner, scientific manner, and, uh, and, and hopefully not have some people that could you know change policies, 
but not really have a full understanding of what they're actually working on. Well, let me let me just go to one example of what what is being worked on by the entire ag community right now, and that would be the Endangered Species Act. Okay, and um, essentially, there's been a lot of litigation. The um, the anti pesticide activists have been filing lawsuits all across the country to try to undermine the registration of products, and they've been claiming that the U.S. EPA has not done their due diligence with respect to the Endangered Species Act. And so some, some courts have vacated registrations. So right now there's a lot of work going on by EPA to come up with a framework. They came, they came out last year with this herbicide um, strategy there's an insecticide strategy that came out this year. There will be a fungicide strategy. And what that means is the agency is going to be looking at and evaluating um, as they go through new registrations and re-registrations how to make sure that they're being responsive and protective of, of, of endangered species. So that process uh, and how that strategy is implemented is very important. And, again, I'll go back to the models. The models that U.S. EPA is using and, and what mitigations they are uh, putting on the labels or pro- going to propose to put on the labels are very important because those, those mitigations that a grower might have to implement have costs associated with them. And so we want to make sure that that is managed properly and there's a lot of comment periods the, the national associations, National Corn Growers, ASA, Farm, Bur- Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, all of the ag groups are actively involved, and Syngenta is partnering with our customers to make sure that the agency gets it right. Are there any other sp- specific issues, especially maybe on the regional or, or say, state basis? I know, you know, like a state like California kind of has its a lot of its <laughs> own regulations you don't even see in other states but uh anything else that you you know is like right now on the on the burner that we didn't touch on there you know i I would just say that you know litigation and um proposed bills happen and uh you know the activist community is is always putting forth things like trying to ban dicamba trying to ban roundup um, and and then there's litigation that's focused on different AIs, and it's so there's a, a daily battle that's done to ensure that um, you know. And my team works on this on behalf of Syngenta and, and our customers and our growers every day to make sure that you know bad science misinformation is not uh, what rules the day. That that the process that we have in place that's science based that make sure that these tools are used properly, um, you know, continues. And so whether it be, you know, legislative proposals that come forward from time to time, I mentioned the one on the seed treatment products, and and we've all seen in the media the attempts to go after glyphosate, um, you know, our job in state affairs at Syngenta is to make sure that good policy rules a day on behalf of our customers, and we're here to fight to make sure that that happens every every day all right well thank you very much dave for visiting with me here i appreciate the time and we're at farm progress show i'm chuck zimmerman reporting this is the agnet news hour i'm sabrina halverson and we will be back in just a moment you're listening to the agnet news hour here's the latest ethanol report the renewable fuels association was at the farm progress show in boone iowa this past week showing off custom flex fuel vehicles and doing lots of interviews with the nearly 100 reporters in attendance who stopped by the exhibit to visit. Chuck Zimmerman was one of those reporters there who talked with the RFA team, starting with Senior Vice President for Industry Relations and Market Development, Robert White, who's in charge of the custom vehicles that he takes around the country to show what ethanol can do. Robert, you know, we're here once again with RFA's Flex Fuel Electric Vehicle, which probably has a lot more miles on it than it did a year ago, I'll bet. But where have you taken this car over the past year, and what have you been able to demonstrate with it? So it's been another wild year with the vehicle. We started out the year in January at the D.C. Auto Show, which was 10 days in front of policymakers, agency folks, and, you know, Joe Public. And what was fun was how many people would come up to us, learn about the vehicle, and say, why isn't that an option for us? 
you know, there's a conversation about going full electric vehicle. Uh, there's a conversation that I'll never own one of those, and we all got to meet in the middle somewhere. Some, someday we will. And this provides that landing spot for the EV only crowd when, you know, things don't develop at the speed they want. And, and for us on the other side, whether it's a range extender or, you know, just for putting around town, uh, the EV side, you know, on a plug in hybrid makes a lot of sense. But it can be backed with 11 gallons in this case, in this vehicle with liquid fuel, low carbon E85, and we can go over 450 miles. So I think the, the writing's on the wall, and we started to see that through some of the automaker announcements that they're leaning more towards the plug-ins as a middle ground. What kind of feedback do you get from people when you display these kinds of vehicles? Well, I mean, here's a good example where we got a hot rod off-road vehicle to set the hook or get the lure out, and then we talk about the EV that's powered by ethanol. And really, it's kind of the best of both worlds. And obviously, we're at an agricultural event and a lot of farmers that don't see these vehicles in their neighborhoods or in their counties. And so you you start that conversation and try and explain that, yes, they're reading headlines that say we're going EV only in seven years, which is partially accurate with current regulation, but that we're fighting on their behalf to make sure not only we're using more ethanol, growing demand here and abroad, but at the same time, we're making sure that we can grind more corn in a market where it's very important. Well, one of our presidential candidates has made his uh, opposition to EVs very clear, and Donald Trump seems to be working with Elon Musk in, in his campaign. Anything you think you could do to draw their attention to what this type of vehicle could do and get their support? Well, I think eventually, you know, Mr. Musk and former President Trump are, are just an examples of that'll never happen, but ironically from two different sides. I think Elon is one of those examples where we will see them looking for a soft landing sp- spot or continuing to diversify what Tesla is involved in, whether that's space travel or uh, I saw something maritime the other day. I mean, it, the, these businesses are going to have to do something different. That only EVs will not survive the shareholder meetings. And on, you know, former President Trump, I mean, he, he always was supportive uh, vocally of ethanol. He did approve E15 at one point, but we had a lot of small refinery exemptions too. So both of those gentlemen uh, need to have continued education. And as they're on the campaign trail, we encourage farmers and anyone listening, our members, of course, to, you know, make that connection and help uh, educate them even more about how important ethanol is uh, to rural America and to the everyday consumer nationwide. Well, USDA just awarded another round of grants to increase the availability of higher blends. Tell us about that and how RFA helps retailers interested in getting those grants. Yeah, since since the dawn of BIP and then turned into HBIP, uh, the last few rounds have actually became came out of the Inflation Reduction Act, and that was $500 million in total that had to be matched, and some of that was matched by corn grower money, uh, retailer, and self-investment. But we've seen uh, stations that have award, been awarded grants from California to Florida and all parts in between, and we've been providing free grant writing services as part of our daily routine at the RFA. And after all these years, we still have a 100% success rate. So we're very proud of our our ability to help those retailers navigate the governmental labyrinth of grant writing and grant navig- uh, you know awardee and what happens even after that. Uh, but it's very important that this infrastructure gets in the ground. I mean, there are a couple states where E15 is required in the future, but in the meantime, uh, again, with the, today's markets, we want to grind more corn and sell more ethanol. How much has the availability of E15 grown this year, and what are the chances California will ever approve the sale of E15 as the only state that does not allow it now? Well, let's start with the first part of that question. It's a little little happier note. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing anywhere from two to three new E15 stations a day, probably one E85 station a day. And E15 is evolving. You know, in the early days, it was, oh, it's a mid-grade, it's unleaded 88. We had all these great marketing ideas. But at the end of the day, it started out just like E10. When E10 debuted, it was a mid-grade, it was 89 octane. And as time went on, the refiners started figuring things out. Marketing uh, groups started figuring things out. And suddenly E10 was the base fuel. That's what we're starting to see across the Midwest and as far you know as Arizona to New York where, oh, we can replace E10 with E15 as long as we still offer an E10 somewhere else. So we're seeing E10 replacement at hundreds of stations 
across the country. And that's really where you start building demand when nearly every consumer filling up at a, a fueling station is using E15. On the flip side in California, uh, it's amazing we're still working on this, but we're also working on year-round E15 at the national level. Uh, California is the last holdout, the last state where you can't sell E15. And ironically, given their low-carbon fuel standard and our low-carbon uh, fuel that, that it makes E15, we could sell it for anywhere from 20 to 25 cents a gallon less today in a state where fuel prices are well over $5 a gallon. Uh, we recently had some discussions with the California Air Resources Board that has to approve E15, and unfortunately we couldn't come to an agreement on many things, and so it, it will at least be another handful of years before uh, E15 is approved because we haven't even started the rulemaking process. RFA President and CEO Jeff Cooper had the opportunity to talk about a number of timely topics, including rail transportation, 45Z tax credit guidance, production, and record export demand. Well, we're at the Farm Progress Show. Why is it important for RFA to have a presence here? Well, you know, I, this is one of my favorite events of the year because it really gives us a chance to hear directly from rank-and-file farmers about what the things that, that they're thinking about and the concerns that they have and the fears that they have um, and the ideas that they have. And, and it's just a, a really a great way for us to, to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in agriculture. Farmers built the ethanol industry, uh, again, as a way to add value to their crops and build demand, local demand, for for the products that, that they were producing. So, um, you know, we are inextricably linked to our with our friends in agriculture and and this is a great way to uh, make sure that we you know are continuing to to build and and uh, expand that relationship rfa was represented at both the rnc and the dnc uh, conventions so what are you going to do to discuss ethanol industry issues with the candidates now well that's correct chuck we did just recently return from both the republican national convention and the dnc uh, last week in Chicago, and and we are a nonpartisan organization. We don't advocate for any particular political party, but we do advocate for ethanol, and, and we advocate and promote policies and, and regulations that are supportive of growth in the industry. And both of those events are really good opportunities for us to sit down with representatives of both those campaigns um, and make sure we are answering their questions about ethanol and renewable fuels. Um, and that we're interacting with those campaigns and, and making sure they have the, the most accurate and factual information. It's also an opportunity for us to, to reconnect with uh, lots of other important and influential politicians who attend those events. Uh, and we made great contacts and had great conversations at both. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. We continue now with the Ethanol Report. Let's turn to another thing. The industry had a little scare last week with the uh, threatened shutdown of rail operations. Uh, this came at the same time that you know ARFA had submitted comments to the Surface Transportation Board about growth in the freight rail industry. Uh, tell us why the rail operations are so important to the ethanol industry and what RFA suggested to the STB. Yeah, it was a dicey situation over the past week uh, around the potential for a, a rail strike and, and closure uh, for CN and, and, and some of the other rail, railroads that run into Canada. Um, obviously, that would have been a huge concern and, and problem for us because Canada is our number one export market. Most of the product that goes north of the border gets there on rail. Uh, so it would have been a major disruption if those lines had, had shut down because of a, of a labor dispute. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, they were able to come to an agreement and, and keep those rail lines running and, and keep keep the trains on the tracks and keep them moving. Uh, but I, I really do think it underscores the importance of rail transportation and having efficient, reliable uh, rail transportation to the ethanol industry. It did. It was just kind of coincidental that we at the same time had responded to an invitation for comment from the Surface Transportation Board asking about what could be improved, what things should they be looking at to make sure that uh, that, that the rail industry continues to serve the needs of the industry. Uh, almost 80% of the ethanol we produce in the United States moves by rail. So, you know, nearly four out of every five gallons is at some point on the rails, and that just, again, really underscores and highlights the importance of having a reliable 
safe and effective and efficient rail system, and that's another. That's that's why it's a, a high priority for us. Well, the carbon capture pipeline project and guidance for the 45Z tax credit are critical for corn ethanol to be part of the future for sustainable aviation fuel. What do you think about the current status of both and whether they'll make the necessary progress that's needed? Well, that's one of the big questions we're we're getting at events like this where you get lots of farmers coming in and saying, hey, so is corn ethanol going to be part of the sustainable aviation fuel opportunity or or not? They're hearing lots of conflicting things and and different uh, viewpoints and and things out there. Um, and, And unfortunately, our answer right now is we're not sure yet because we're still waiting on guidance and rules from the Treasury Department on how that 45Z tax credit is going to work um, and exactly what this opportunity might look like for for corn ethanol as a feedstock for SAF. We're hopeful that we're going to see a proposal from the Treasury in the next month or so, um, and we're hopeful that it avoids some of the problems with the precursor tax credit, which was called the 40B Sustainable Aviation Fuel Tax Credit. Lots of things that we did not like about um, the way Treasury rolled that out. They were very prescriptive on what sort of ag practices can be used to lower carbon intensity, uh, and it had several other problems. So we're hopeful that Treasury heard heard our feedback on that, again, that, that kind of precursor tax credit, and they correct a lot of those flaws when they put the proposal out for 45Z. You know, the other thing we're, we're keeping an eye on is that credit, according to the law, uh, is supposed to be available. Uh, it's supposed to be effective on January 1st of 2025. That's a few months away, and we still don't have rules yet around how it's going to operate. We don't have much more clarity on how the carbon intensity values are going to be uh, calculated. So there's a lot of work for Treasury to do in a very short time. And, of course, we've got an election in the middle of all that, and that could uh, certainly influence and shape the timeline for, for when these rules come out. So, uh that's, that's at the top of our list as we look at things that need to get done between now and the end of the year. So it was another great year for RFA at the Farm Progress Show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you need any more information about ethanol, just go to the RFA website, ethanolrfa.org. And that's the Ethanol Report. Thanks for listening. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halbertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.